So who's my person tonight that's going to give me a recap of where we've been all week? I can't see anything. This is, um, these are Airhead Extremes. I purchased these at a movie place once. They were seven bucks. All right, so who, okay, so right here, I'm going to need you really loud to let us know where we've been far, how, where we've been so far. True friendship does what? Are you ready? Invites. Invites? Hold on. Okay, here we go. Includes? Hears? You got it. Defends? Purifies? Serves? And then we're waiting. All righty, awesome. Here you go. I want to tell you guys about a time I saw something very uh, disturbing in my hometown. I just drive, uh, just gone through the drive-thru, one of my favorite places, McDonald's. Can't beat the dollar menu. Went through the drive-thru, got a nice cold water. It was a hot summer day, and I was driving past my high school. And I just thought this was, it, it made me sick. I thought it was the McDonald's at first, but it wasn't. It was what I witnessed. There were these guys, and they were pushing what looked to be like a giant metal object. And there were, there were pads on this object. And these guys had pads on their shoulders, and they were pushing this across this field. And some of them were laying on the ground, doing push-ups over and over again. And I'm sitting there eating my McDonald's hamburger, drinking my ice-cold water in my air-conditioned car. I'm just troubled. I don't understand why anybody would take their summer and do something like that. And I literally, I was concerned for these guys. Some of them I knew. And so later I asked them, like, what are you guys doing? And I found out they go in the morning and they do this, and then they come back later and do it again. I was like, these people are nuts. <laughs> Fast forward, fall hits. I'm in pet band. So our band gets up there, and all those guys I saw come running out on this giant field with this odd-shaped ball. And they're really good. And the crazy thing about athletes, the crazy thing about football players, is what they have to go through to get to where they need to be to be successful, including in doing disturbing stuff in the summer. It's called Daily Doubles. Any football players in here? Anyone uh, eat McDonald's and watch the football players in disgust right here? Yeah. But here's the thing. I have nothing negative to say because I respect that. There's something in someone that says, this is going to kill me. Literally, kids probably died pushing that giant piece of metal. But there was something in them that kept them going, even though I'm sure at times they wanted to quit. They had a goal in mind. They knew they were heading to something great when football season started. And they got to be backed up by our pet band. And the lights came on. There was something great coming ahead, and it kept them going. And I'm sure at times they wanted out. And I wonder if you guys have ever been in a situation where you wanted out. Maybe you're in a sport. Maybe you're a swimmer or a tennis player. Or maybe you're in track. That's insane. That's insane. What's more insane is cross country. You just keep going. There's no end. You just keep going. That's crazy. But check this out. In every athlete, I've got to imagine there's a time where you're like, I want out. I'm hurting. There's people that like break their legs and keep going. At that time, I'd be like, time out. Just broke my femur. I need a break. People keep going. It's crazy. Maybe you guys are into gaming and you're like, I've been playing this game for 16 hours, but doggone it, I'm going to beat it before I lay my head on the pillow tonight. And they just keep going. Or maybe you went to an all-nighter once and you're like, I've got to, or maybe you're a rock star drinker and you're like, I'm fine. It's 4 a.m., no problem. 
Have you guys ever felt like, like maybe you guys are there right now. You're like, my body is going to collapse if I stand up out of this chair. I'm out. I want to get out. Have you ever felt like your body's ready to be done? Anyone try it in wakeboard this week? I tried that once. Like, first time, I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> that was really hard. We know how it feels in our body when we're like, I am done. That was really hard. And there's something that we respect about people who keep going. I want to ask you, has there ever been a time in your life where circumstances were so tough, you're like, I just want this to be done? This is too much. Maybe you've been in a time in your life where you're like, I want to be done, and then something else hits, and you're like, are you kidding me? I want out, and I don't know how I'm going to get through this. We've been looking at the life of Jesus Christ since we got here. He's had a pretty amazing life. He has a, gr a group of guys traveling with him, thousands of people are coming to hear him speak. He's freeing people of oppression, of demons. He's healing people. People are walking, seeing. It's an amazing time. But even Jesus, fully God, fully man, comes to a place where he says, you know what, I, I, I want out. This is tough. And I want to talk to you guys about a time in Jesus' life that we don't often think about. And it's a time that he spent with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so if you have your Bibles with you, we're just going to read this together. I'm going to talk a couple things about what's going on. We're going to start in verse 32, and I believe it's on the screen behind me if you want to follow along. In Mark 14, 32, it says, They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. This is Jesus talking. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I don't know about a down moment in your life, but that sounds like one for Jesus. I have so much sorrow in my heart. It's to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And the cup that Jesus is talking about, this is just a, a simple one from the store. He's talking about take this cup from me. And what this cup represents is God's wrath and judgment against every evil thing that humans have done. And what's about to happen if you read further in the story, is Jesus gets arrested. They try him because he's claiming to be God. They sentence him to crucifixion on the cross. And he dies a criminal's death, even though he's innocent. And what happens on that day is God's anger and wrath and, justice, and, and his justice is poured out on Jesus when he dies on a cross. Now, you guys might be asking, why does God have wrath stored up? against humans. Why did Jesus have to die for our sins? This seems crazy. There's something about God that's really important to know. He is a God of justice. And that means when someone sins or does something that breaks God's standard, there is a punishment for that. We live in a country where there's a justice system. If you go and steal my car and we go to court, the judge isn't going to be like, hey, you're a nice guy, no big deal. He's going to say, no, you stole that guy's car, and you're going to have to pay for that. And we're, we're broken people, and we have a sense of justice. If someone came up to you in front of your counselor and just punched you in the stomach, and you're like, ah, oh, and the counselor's like, hey, no big deal, you would be like, no, that is a big deal. We don't like it when justice is brought upon us for our sin. We don't like being called, but we definitely want other people called to account when they do stuff to us. And we as humans have done some horrible, horrible things on human standards. But God's standards are far greater. And so the reality is, if we've broken any part of his perfect law, as you read through the Bible, any of his commands, if we break them, the punishment is death. And that might sound hard to believe, but that's what Jesus went to the cross to do, to die in our place, to take our punishment. I have one more passage to read to you, but I want to let you know that true friendship endures instead of bailing when times get tough. And that's exactly what Jesus did. 
times were difficult, and he said, God, your anger and your wrath against all the evil that mankind has done, it needs to be justified. Someone has to die for it. And I'm willing to do that. But if there's any other way, I would love for this cup to pass. And what does Jesus say? Not my will, but your will. And God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for our sin so that we could be justified. And I want to share with you a simple passage that many of you may know in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 10. Or verse 21, sorry. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. You see, the Old Testament is full of these laws and commands that no one can live up to or no one has. But one person did. Anyone want to take a guess who did? Jesus did. He lived up to every single one of them. So all these laws, all these prophets testify that if you want to live a perfect life and be with God and be free from sin, you have to be perfect. And yet no one's done it. So there's got to be a different way. And Jesus comes, lives that perfect life, and he is that way. And all the Bible points to him coming and being our hope for getting out of the punishment that we deserve. All the laws and the prophets testify to this. Verse 22, this righteousness from God, it comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This is the crazy part. Even though he was perfect, God's only son, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. He said, I am a perfectly just God, and I cannot let sin go unpunished. And because I love people so much, I'm going to punish my only son. He's going to take the fall for what you did. That is radical. I mean, imagine you committed a crime, and you're in court. You, like, embezzled a million bucks, and you're facing 10 years to life for what you did. You can't go back and erase it. You can't be like, hey, can I pick up trash? To like kind of wipe out this embezzlement thing? And imagine someone comes into the courthouse, judges looking at you, and they say, I'll take his sentence. I'll go 10 years to life for him because I love him. See, that's the reality that we stand in. We cannot go back and take away our sin. What some people do is try to outweigh it with all the good things that they do or work really hard. Or some people try to downplay their sin. Even though they were deceitful or prideful, they're like, well, that guy just stole a car and embezzled a million dollars, so I'm actually all right. Like, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be standing next to that guy, like the little sibling who points out their older sibling to get out of trouble for what they did. But the reality is there's nothing we can do to take away what we deserve for what we have done. We can try and redefine God and say, hey, God, I think you should work on my standards. But God says, hey, I'm the one that created everything, and things go by my standard, and I am just. And if you sin... The penalty for that is death. And that might seem harsh and very unloving. But when he sends his son to take that punishment for you, that's the most selfless, loving act anyone could ever do. And so I believe that tonight there are four types of people in this room in regards to Jesus Christ, what he did on the cross for your behalf. I believe there's some of you guys that are very skeptical and maybe don't believe any of this. It sounds too far-fetched. It, it can't be possible. I want to say I'm really glad that you've been with us this week. Like, I'm really thankful that you're here at Black Lake. And my encouragement to you is, is keep seeking the claims of Jesus. Keep looking into this idea of justice and sin and the fact that we're not as good as we think we are. And, and keep looking into the claims of who Jesus says he is and why we need him. So if you're skeptical... Or maybe just don't believe this at all. I, I really, I say it again, I am really glad you're here. I hope you've had a great time, but keep seeking. And there's a second type of person who's here. And it's the person who said, I'm going to follow Jesus. And you're doing that. And you might come to a point in your faith where you're like, I want out. I'm getting made fun of at school. Living for Jesus is challenging. It's not glamorous at times. 
Maybe you're feeling like, I'm starting to kind of doubt. If you're a follower of Jesus and you're struggling, I want to encourage you to endure, to keep going. To don't stop no matter what happens, because Jesus endured for us. And there are days in my life where I feel like, is this really what I should be doing following Jesus? And then I remember what he did for me, and it keeps me going. And so I want to encourage you, no matter how hard it may get, keep following Jesus because he is our only hope. He is our only way to God, back to our creator. And I believe there's a third type of person here tonight. And it's a person who's never, ever made a commitment to follow Jesus, but they want to. And they don't really know where to start. And so in a little bit, I'm going to give you an opportunity to take that first step to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I want you to be a part of my life. And I also believe there's a fourth person, and we talked about this on the first night, that sometimes swimmers are most prone to be dehydrated. And maybe you've grown up in church, and you've heard everything I'm saying every Sunday since you were a fetus. And I want to tell you that it might be the very water that you need to live and to have hope and to have eternal life. And so if you want to take that first step and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I, I want to trust in his work on the cross that he died in my place. I realize that I've broken God's perfect standard, and without Jesus, I have no hope. If you want to take that first step, I want to encourage you to just walk up here. We're going to pray for you. We're going to have some counselors to pray for you. And if you say, you know what, I've been around this my whole life, but I want a fresh start. I want to make a recommitment. I want to encourage you to walk up. It might be really uncomfortable. There might be two of you, but we want to pray for you. And we want to give you opportunity and space for you to talk to Jesus and, and maybe have a counselor pray for you too. So we're going to sing a song. And if you feel that you want to come up and pray that, please feel free to just walk up and we're going to pray for you. So as they sing, just feel, feel free. There is no pressure. We love you no matter what, but we want to give opportunity for those people who want that to just come on up. And as these guys come up, if I could have counselors come who are willing to pray over them, that would be great. If you're one of the people that wants to make that first commitment, that first step, I'm going to pray a prayer specifically for you, and I just want you to say what I'm saying from your heart. It's not my prayer that's going to save you. It's your heart's prayer. Jesus, I realize that I have fallen short of what you've called me to. I recognize that. I realize apart from you, I don't have hope of life beyond this one. I don't have hope of freedom from my sin. So Jesus, I commit my life to follow you. I ask you to come into my life and cleanse my heart for the inside out. Purify my heart so I don't have to keep acting and trying to change my behaviors. Jesus, I give you my life. Please cleanse my heart from the inside out. Give me that hope of eternal life. Thank you for going to the cross for me. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you're that person who you feel like I've heard this a million times, but I want a fresh start. I want to pray a prayer specifically for you. Lord Jesus, I know you've always been there, but God, I've been distracted. I have not been listening. My heart is hard. There's things in my life I haven't brought to you, or maybe I've just not given you the time of day. And Jesus, I want a fresh start with you. And Jesus, so tonight I rededicate my life to you. I recognize what you've done for me, and I just thank you for that with all my heart. Would you give me strength and power to follow you for the rest of my life? And I just pray that this moment would be a time I can look back and say, Jesus, I said yes to you. 
even when it gets tough. God, I pray for all my friends here that you would help them endure because you endured for them. And when they are faithless, you are faithful. And when they went out, Jesus, you went all the way for them. You gave your life. I pray that you would protect that, that it would sink deep down into their hearts and they would not let go of the hope that is you, Jesus. So as we worship you, I pray that you would speak to them through your Holy Spirit. Comfort them. Let them know who they are in you now. That they would not look back, but they would look forward to the life that is ahead. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.